prior to that cost on the top of the hill, you'll see that first, right? So the optimal cost would have been negative infinity if you take this <coughs> giant negative infinity slide, right? Um, but you never saw it. So in order for UCS to be optimal, we have to at least say you don't have negative costs, right? Mm -hmm. What happens if we have zero costs? This is pretty easy to conceptualize. You can imagine you have some cycle of zero costs that you just get stuck exploring over and over and over and over, right? If you don't want to talk about cycles, maybe you have a zero cost region that goes on forever but not towards the goal, right? Okay. So then maybe we can say non-negative, right? UCS is optimal for non-negative costs. Is this sufficient? Who says yes? Who says no? Good. Why? Anybody? That don't include zero, right? Uh, no. Okay. Let's say is positive. Depends on the definition of non-negative, I guess. So. <laughs> sure. I'll change this next time. Okay. How about non-zero and positive? Or non-zero and non-negative? Is that sufficient? Who says no? Who says yes, that's sufficient? Okay, does anybody think no and maybe have an idea why it would be insufficient? Anybody? Okay, so I want you to imagine something. Let's say that you have some graph, and maybe I'll draw it because I'm a bummer. Uh, just imagine it, it'll be very simple. You have some graph, you have cost two that gets you to the goal, right? Going in the other direction, you could have a node that takes cost one to get to, right? And then there's another one expanding from there that has half as your cost. And then there's another one that has a quarter, and then an eight, and a sixteenth, right? You see where I'm going? You're gonna go that way forever, because, well, for finite time, right? Because that's always less than two, which is the cost of the optimal. So what you really have to say is that you need to guarantee that every cost is greater than some non-negative constant. That constant, though, can be arbitrarily small, right? Does that make sense? So we're all on the same page there? Great. Yeah, there's some nuance there. It's important. Um, it's not going to be on the test, right? But uh, there's no tests. That's very good. Um, <laughs> there may be tests later in life that have that question. It's not going to be my OK. <laughs> well, it's not going to be my test in this class. All right. I also want to talk about, yes? Is Dijkstra's algorithm so Dijkstra's algorithm. Is there a key difference on these two? They're very, very similar. So we talked about uniform cost search on trees. Uniform cost search on graphs. We'll talk about today. Okay. Looks almost identical to Dijkstra's, except for the classical definition of Dijkstra is the shortest path between the start and all nodes. Um, but if you know the full node or there's multiple full nodes, I, they're very, very, very similar. <coughs> okay. I also want to talk about the relevance of simplifying assumptions. So when I was drawing on the board talking about kind of a toy example in robotics, the point came up that this toy example robot had to be able to perfectly sense its world in order to apply these algorithms that I was talking about, right? It was also pointed out that's kind of a bad assumption, right? It's a pretty strong simplifying assumption. So what's the point? The point I want to make is that it's often valuable to make very strong simplifying assumptions in order to gain intuition about various algorithms as you apply them to your more toy problem, um, in order to show other people how those things work, and also in order to work on problems that have manageable sizes. You can imagine that if nobody was allowed to work on path planning for robots until sensing had been solved, uh, that might be an issue, right? So it's, it's okay to explore these things kind of in parallel, but I wasn't happy with how I answered that question then, so I kind of wanted to Okay. We all on the same page? Everybody feel good? Awesome. Okay, so today we're going to take uninformed search and we're going to inform it. This is very exciting. This is one of my favorite uh, lectures in this whole class because today we get to eight star search, which is one of the most powerful algorithms we'll talk about. Okay, so involved in informed search is the notion of heuristics that we'll talk about, greedy search, which is the type of search that's informed, and then A star. And then we'll also talk about the difference uh, between Tree search and grass search. Okay, which I've kind of blended uh, up to now, so I'll unclear that. Okay, so let's recap. What is search? So we define pretty specifically a search problem, right? We have some set of states. This represents the configuration of the world. This is generally a simplified version of the world, right? Some model. You don't really want to model the entire 
true world in all cases, might be too big, might have irrelevant details, right? So this is a model. <coughs> we have some set of actions that you can take from every state and costs associated with those actions, right? We also have a successor function. This is where you're encoding kind of the dynamics of the world. And so this takes some state action pair and the cost, right, which is part of the action, and provides you with the subsequent state. So where do you end up if you start in one state and apply some actions, right? We also have some start state, and key to this, as I touched on a minute ago, is a goal test. You wanna be able to say, Search trees are uh, when you're building up this tree-like data structure, and, well not tree-like, it's exactly a tree, right? And every node represents a plan for reaching the state that is encoded in that node, right? So each node in the tree is not necessarily just a state, right? It encodes the path that you took to get to that state, right? Okay, then we noted that plans generally have costs. This is the sum of the action costs that it took to get there, right? And then we can search over this tree, right? Well, generally we're systematically building this tree as we search, right? You don't want to build the whole thing in advance. Generally, that's a bad idea. The crux here is cho choosing how you're going to order which nodes that exist in the fringe or the frontier are being expanded at what time, right? We have a notion of optimal. Does it find the least cost plan that is possible? And then there was also the notion of complete. Does it find a plan if one exists? Right? Okay. Search is not always just Google Maps or pathing Pac-Man or moving your bug things in StarCraft. I don't know if you say StarCraft, but there's bug things, right? So uh, it's not always pathing, right? Um, let's look at a pretty different example of what you could use search to solve. Let's talk about flipping pancakes. It's a very important problem, right? We all think about this on a pretty regular basis. Okay, so let's say I have a stack of four pancakes of different sizes. And I don't like when I have larger pancakes above smaller uh, raised pancakes. So what I would like to do is flip these pancakes so that they reorder themselves such that it goes from the largest at the bottom to the smallest at the top. And what I can do is I can insert a spatula in between some two pancakes and I can completely flip the ones that are above the spatula, right? I don't have two skillets, I don't have a waiting area that I can flip pancakes onto and move them around, this is, this is how it works. Okay, so what's the size of the state space here? Let's raise hands. I like, I like raised hands. Yes. Okay, which is? That's right. Okay, and why is that? option, you have four pancakes. So then for the second option, now you're down to three pancakes, and then two for the third, and one for the fourth. So yep. four pancakes, right? Exactly. What's the size of your set of actions that you're taking? Yes, I guess that's true. Yes. And it would be two. Why is it two? Right, and so it could be four, because you can flip all four at once, you can flip all the top three, you can flip the top two, or you can flip the top one, but does flipping the top one really change anything? Yes. Didn't you say you could only flip three at a time? If I said that, I was misspeaking. You can flip anything above your spatula. So you can place your spatula at any one of these four. You just said you can put the spatula between two pancakes? That, I, that is, uh, I misspoke. You can put it under all four of them, yeah. flip all four. Okay, so let's start over. You flip all four. What's the set of the actions here? The size of the actions. Let's go with three. Maybe you can say four, but one of those doesn't really affect the world <coughs> in any meaningful way, right? Yes. That's a lot like flipping the first one. It could be, it depends on how you're defining the problem. Let's for now talk about the action set that's uh, three. So we want to at least change the world with every action. <coughs> okay. What would be a good cost associated with actions? Here? Yes. Maybe one, right? Maybe every time you flip any number of pancakes, that's equivalent, right? Yes. Maybe the weight of all the pancakes, so you could say like flipping all four. 
one costs four, flipping three costs three. Yes, I like that. Let's go with that. So I'm a roboticist. So I'm going to say that it's harder for my robot to flip four pancakes than it is to flip three pancakes. It takes more energy, right? I expend my batteries faster, potentially. Uh, sorry, not my bad, the robot's batteries, if that's why you left it. But uh, I'm a person. We went over this, I think, <laughs> earlier in the class. Uh, I don't run on batteries, but OK. That's just what a robot would say. That, oh. <laughs> and he got me, just like that. <laughs> OK. Yes, so let's go with that. Let's say that the cost is the number of pancakes you flipped in a given hour. OK, so I mentioned robots, right? Maybe we want to build pancake flipping robots. People have built robots for sillier things, for sure. I've built robots maybe for sillier things. Actually, I have. I'll show you that next time. Um, <laughs> weird days. OK. but. Some people have thought of this problem in ways that you might not expect. Some pretty famous people. Does anybody recognize the first author of this paper? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that is Bill Gates. Fun fact, Albuquerque is where I'm from. So he and I share that among many other things. <laughs> um, and now you know some question answers to my uh, reset my password questions. <laughs> Bill Gates is the answer to every question. All right, no. OK, so. Bill Gates um, and his co-author here wrote this paper using pancake flipping as an abstraction for sorting. So um, it's an interesting problem, maybe for reasons that don't have to do with pancakes, right? So let's look at what this might look like. So here I have part of the state space graph with the costs as the weights. I'm not showing the whole graph here, right? But you can kind of see how the transitions work, right? So if we start up at the top, we can flip all four. Right, that takes us with cost four to the left here. We can flip the top three. That takes us with cost three to the very right. Coincidentally, that is a goal state, right? We can instead flip two. That takes us to this middle state, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? OK, so let's go back for a second to tree search, which is what we've been talking about up to this point. OK, so we have some start state, right? We're going to say. We're not done, so let's take the one state we have and we're going to put it on the fringe, right? Then we're going to say, let's pop the best state with some priority off the fringe. That's the start state, right? Then we're going to look at what states can be reached from there, and we're going to push all those onto the fringe, right? This is what we went over last week. Okay, so again, we're building this tree by considering current states and then progressions of actions that transform the world into subsequent states, right? Okay, so then depending on which version of tree search you're using, you're going to expand from the fringe in different ways, right? Eventually, you're going to expand some goal, some state that when you check whether it's the goal, it is, right? And you've solved your problem in some way or another, right? As I mentioned, the difference generally between the three tree search strategies we talked about last time was how you're handling the order in which you expand things from the fringe or the frontier, right? And conceptually, all of the three strategies we described can be implemented as priority queues, but VFS and DFS specifically have other data structures that are going to be slightly more efficient, um, but more specialized, right? Okay, so that's uninformed search. We talked specifically about uninformed cost search as the best, maybe, of those, depending on what you're looking for, but certainly the one that works with costs associated with edges, <laughs> right? And the strategy there for expanding the fringe was to expand the one with the lowest half cost, right? The lowest summation that it took to get there. The good things about this is that that's complete and not bad. But we mentioned that there might be something bad about that, and that's that you can explore options in every direction, right? There's no information in your exploration strategy about where the goal is, but that's not always the case. You might have some intuition behind where the goal is, right? So let's look at this problem here. This is just like last time, except for there's no obstacles. Um, everything's the same cost, right? So that's how uniform cost search works, right? And it's expanding in this cost sphere, right? Uh, in this case, you're looking at Manhattan distance, so it looks like a square in this space, but that's really a cost sphere, right? <coughs> how does it look uh, in a more complicated problem with, say, Pac-Man? So this is visualized a little differently than the stuff we were looking at last <coughs> week. Basically here, if it's shaded red, it was expanded. 
The brighter red it is, the earlier in the process it was expanded. So you can kind of see over time without having to rerun the video. Right? What's worth noting here is that every single state in this was expanded with the exception of the one, you see the one up there, kind of top near the right edge, right? Okay, so uniform cost search might not be the best strategy, right? Well, let's talk about informing our search. We're gonna do that with a concept called heuristics. How many people have heard of heuristics in the search? Okay, good, you should have seen this in your algorithms class, right? Uh, awesome. So to recap then, heuristic is a function that estimates how close the state is to the goal. This is designed heuristically for your specific search problem, right? The word heuristic has many meanings. They overlap here, probably not coincidentally, right? Okay, up till now, every search has been agnostic kind of of how you're setting the instance of your problem, right? But now things are starting to get problem specific. Okay, so what are some examples for heuristics that you can see for this, uh, this specific problem? Yes? Straight up distance. From the goal. So, like you put either. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, that would work. If you know where the goal is in the 2D world, you know where the packet is sitting currently, that's much easier to answer like, the distance than how you get there. Right? Okay, good. What about something else? The intuition here is that that may not align with how Pac Man moved exactly in this space there, right? Yes? Is there something? Counting the number of walls just on like an L path. Counting the number of walls along an L path. So we're very close to what I was looking for. I'm not going to say that's not right either. Um, counting the number of like obstacles along the way. Okay, I'd have to think about that more, but it might it might be good. Yes. The Manhattan distance. That's exactly what I was thinking of, which is very very similar to what you said. That's this L shape, right? So Pac-Man can only move left, right, up, or down. So in Pac-Man's world, distance sits on a grid, right? Which we call Manhattan distance. Okay, so uh, both of those are example of good heuristics. I wanna think more about yours. Uh, it might also be. So which is better then between Manhattan distance and Euclidean distance? And I've kind of hinted at this. Yes? Are you saying what's better than both of those? No, which of the two is better? Um, in that case, I would say Manhattan distance because the Euclidean distance might underestimate the cost for a diagonal. Okay. I mean, it certainly will underestimate the cost for diagonals, right? Um, is that a bad thing? No, I don't know. We'll kind of get there. I want to answer this question. Yes? Isn't it just based on what sort of environment you're in? I mean, for Pac Man, we would consider Manhattan distance better, but if Pac Man was allowed to move in diagonal, so certainly, if Pac-Man was allowed to move in diagonals, or let's say at any angle, or some very finely districtized version of the angles, Euclidean distance would more closely align with how Pac-Man moves, and Manhattan distance more closely aligns in this setting with how Pac-Man moves. My intuition says that probably makes it better, but we'll have to see how the search algorithm works. Right? Yes. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I was going to say, like, in this case, when you say Manhattan distance, is that, like, the whole path around, or is that just, like, just Tetris block, you know? Very good question. Okay, so here, if you know the distance to get to the goal that includes the obstacles, you're done, right? Well, okay. certainly you're closer to done than if you don't know that. Yeah. Right? Well, more along the lines of, like, if you did Manhattan, if there was a maze where, like, the dot was right here, and you had to go all the way up and around, right? Like then it might not work well yeah, exactly. to consider this as your guiding principle. Yeah. Right? yeah, and that's true. And we'll kind of see that a little bit later. Here, when we say Euclidean distance and Manhattan distance, we're talking about ignoring yeah. the walls, right? Because it's, it's a heuristic, right? And what you want out of a heuristic, and I'll get to this in a minute also, is you want it to be cheap to compute. Because if it costs as much to generate a heuristic as it does to solve your problem, you're not saving anything, right? Okay. Okay, so here's the Manhattan distance ignoring the walls, right? Here's the Euclidean distance um, ignoring the walls. Both of these I think would work pretty well. Maybe the Manhattan distance intuitively might work a little more better, more well because it's more closely aligned with how Pac-Man moves, but I'm not sure. Okay, so let's talk about heuristics for a different kind of problems. So we had this problem last time where we're trying to go from Iran to Bucharest. 
let's use Euclidean distance here. I think it's Euclidean distance. We'll use this table, right? Your heuristic function doesn't need to be something that you compute analytically. It could be a lookup table if you're able to enumerate all your states, right? It just has to be some value for every state. Okay, so let's have this heuristic, which I believe is the Euclidean distance, um, straight line distance to the bricks. Okay, good, it's wrong. That's awesome. That might work really well. What would be an example heuristic for our pancake flipping problem? Yes. Um, you said to use the eight by eight puzzle as an example, and is it like the number of correct states? Okay, so we'll talk about that puzzle later on in the lecture. But what's so you're you're equating that heuristic to this? Yeah. So how would you map that heuristic to this problem? Uh, like the very top one would have uh, like two out of four, and uh, the other ones would vary like uh, depending on where the pancake is in this. It's how many of them are in that correct position? Yeah, definitely. Um, what's another option? Yes? I point it to you, but we'll get to everybody. Uh, continue on that line and say that's like it is correct the distance to correct for everything? Distance to correct. Add them together. That's nuanced. I think that that might work. Um, yes? Don't flip pancakes that are do not flip the bottom pancake if it is below this. Okay, yeah, that I think is a good strategy. Um, a heuristic, though, is some value assigned to the action space. So that's a complicated way to describe the action, or some value, right? It's a, it's a don't take these actions when in some specific state, but rather than some numerical value. Right. Yes? I would put more weight on the stuff on the bottom, because that means you just don't have the messages. So however many states are correct from the bottom up. Okay, that might work too. Yes? It seems like you can actually be very close to a correct solution, even if a lot of them are not already in independent order. Like that very top one up there, it's only one flip away, but if you're just, if your heuristic is looking for all of them are descending, it would take you very long. But what's the cost of one flip? Oh, that would actually be a flip. I guess you could have a heuristic though where it could check whether they're in ascending or descending order. Potentially. Like how many are in order with the one in front of it? Potentially. <laughs> Let's talk about maybe the number of the largest pancake that's still out of place. This is the one I want to talk about at least for a minute, right? And so if we look at the heuristic values here, so the number, that would be the pancake that is the largest pancake that's still out of place, right? Because if the fourth largest pancake is not in the right place, at some point you're gonna to have to flip all four. You're gonna to have to do some flips at least, right? Does that make sense? Okay, my point is that there's many ways to describe various heuristics. Uh, we're gonna see some conditions that I think make for good heuristics when you're talking about A-star search, um, but oftentimes just heuristics that sound reasonable even if they don't mean those specific conditions work really well too. We may lose some guarantees though. Okay, so let's talk about research. Okay, let's talk about research. Okay, so going back to this example, we have some heuristics defined, some heuristic values defined over every state, right? So what if we say, we're assuming that these are kind of some estimate, right, of how, it's, how much it's gonna to take to get to both of those states, right? What if we use those exactly and just expand the node in our search tree that seems the closest by that heuristic value, right? So let's talk about going from Iran to Bucharest. Okay, so we started to run, right? Its heuristic value is 366. It has these children, these children end up on our fringe, right, with these heuristic values. So research is gonna say, I'm going to pop off the fringe, the one that has the lowest heuristic value, right? And from there, we're gonna plop that one's children onto the fringe, right, and go on from there. Until we end up with Bucharest on our fringe, which has, well, if it's a good heuristic, zero, right? It doesn't take any cost to get from Bucharest to Bucharest. And so we pop that. 
Now we have this path, right? What can go wrong in this case, though? Well, our heuristic is an estimate of the distance to the nearest goal for each state, right? But that may not work well depending on how good your estimate is or some specific cases about your search states, right? So in the worst case, in fact, free search can act like a badly guided depth first search in which you're looking at everything except for the optimal path uh, until you get to the optimal path. But generally speaking, it's not gonna be that bad. That's kind of the bad luck, right? And to envision that, you can imagine the maze we were talking about earlier, wherein the optimal solution is to just go around the edge, right? But it's going to expand based on, say, you use the Euclidean distance, try to get close to it, and then expand out, right, before it ever goes backwards. Makes sense? Okay. So let's look at the uh, how free search may work on this case. Does anybody want to guess if we use, let's say we use Euclidean distance here uh, as our heuristic, what's this going to look like? Great. That seems pretty optimal to me, right? Very frequently greedy search works really well. Let's look at greedy search where we use Manhattan distance as the heuristic on this example. Pretty good, right? It certainly did less work than uniform cost search. But <coughs> did it find the optimal? Did not. Right? I mean, I don't want to get out the measuring tape, but it looks like going right first would have been a better solution. But going right first meant that you got further from your goal, which was a higher heuristic cost, right, than uh, going left. So that's why it did that. Okay, so going back to this example, if we look here at the very specific heuristics, going from Arad to Sibiu, I think that's how you pronounce that, uh, seems reasonable. It's this next step that we got into trouble. And that's because we didn't pay any attention to the cost it took us to get from Sibiu to Thagoras. Instead, we just noted that Thagoras was closer than any of the other places we could go right now, right? So you can imagine if you had one state that got pretty close, and then a bunch of states that made small incremental pro progress, you wouldn't explore those first, right? Because you're not considering the cost of transition, right? Okay, so maybe we can consider both, and that's where ASTAR comes in. Okay, so ASTAR combines this notion that we've been using for uniform cross search as well as greedy search, right? So looking at this graph and its uh, corresponding search tree to the right, uniform cost orders by path cost, we call this backward cost. Okay, we're gonna call that G of N. N is a node, G is a function of a node that gives you the backward cost. Okay, that's the cost it took to get there. All right, so if we start at S, then how is uniform cost gonna work? All right, so we push S onto our fringe, we pop S off of our fringe, we add its children to the fringe, that's A, right? Then we pop, that's A, we add A's children to the fringe, that's B and E, right? And B has a key value of two, and E has a key value of nine, right? So what gets popped next? B, right? And then we go down, we add these children C, that has a value of one for the transition, which means it has a value of three for its backward cost, shown in G over here, and so we don't explore anywhere else, right? I forgot to say we added B, but it still works, right? Okay, greedy search orders by goal proximity, or forward proxy. So without getting into details about how H here is computed, if we have the H value associated with each node that you see here, how is greedy search gonna work? So we started S, we add A, we pop A, we add B, D, and E, I forgot to say it last time. Um, and then what happens? So B has a heuristic value of six, D has a heuristic value of two, and E has a heuristic value of one. So what gets popped next? E, right? It's the lowest between one, five, and six. Okay, so we add E's children, that's D. D has a heuristic value of two. So now on in the fringe are two, and six, right? I may have messed this up, but that's, yeah. you can see where we're going. Okay, and so then we're gonna pop D, push G, which has a heuristic value of zero. So now G is on the fringe, as well as B, and yeah, just that. And then we're, what are we gonna pop at that point? G, right, because that's the lowest heuristic value. Okay, so that's how greedy search will work. 
Okay, so A star search is going to order these by the sum of the backward cost and the forward cost. Okay, so that's G of n for the backwards cost, H of n for our heuristic. F of n, or the F cost, this is going to be the key value that A star uses in the priority queue. And that's how we're going to order. Okay? <clears throat> All right, this is important. So let's look at this just for a second. We have our F cost. That is the sum of the backward cost and the forward cost. The forward cost is our heuristic. The backward cost is the cost it took to get to where we are, to get to n specifically. And the sum of those is F of n. Okay. When should we stop? Should we stop when we push a goal into our priority queue? Who says yes, we should stop? <coughs> okay, who says no? Okay, well let's look at an example. So let's look at this example specifically. All right, so what's our priority queue? Okay, so we start with S, right? We push S. S has a G, a backwards cost of zero, right? Because this is the start. It has a heuristic of three, because that's how I've defined it here. Right, for an F cost of three, right? Okay, well now we need to pop something off the queue. What do we choose? S, because it's the only one there, right? We add its children A, which has a backward cost of two and a heuristic of two for a total of four, and B, which has a backward cost of two and a heuristic value of one for a total of three. And it's worth noting that this isn't B, the node in the graph. This is S to B, the node in the search tree, right? Okay, so now we need to pop something off this priority queue. What do we choose? S to B. We add its children. That includes S to B to G, which has a backward cost of five and a heuristic value of zero for a total of five. Right? So we just push it off. Are we done? No. no. We have to stop only when we dequeue a goal. Right? And so if we go back to this and pretend we're going to continue going, what we pop off next, the lower value between four and five, is S to A. We add its children, S to A to G. That has a value of four. We pop off the lowest value one there. We check whether it's a goal we succeeded, right? Okay, is A star optimal? Who says yes? Who says no? Who says I haven't given you enough information yet to answer that question? Okay, so as I've described it without any qualifiers on your heuristic function, it is not optimal. So let's look at this example. Okay, so we've got this pretty simple graph here. Again, we push S onto our priority queue. It has a heuristic value of seven and a cost of cone of zero, right? We pop that off because it's the only one there. We add its children. That is S to A, which has a backward cost of one and a heuristic value of six for a total of seven, and S to G, which has a backward cost of five, a heuristic value of zero for a total of five, right? And then we pop one off, that's S to G. We have popped off a goal state. So as we've defined it so far, we're done. A star is over, we found the path to the goal. But this is obviously not the optimal path, right? Okay, so what went wrong? Yes? That's right, so the heuristic value kind of dominated the uh, in a not formal definition. Overpowered is a better one, maybe, uh, since dominates overloaded. It overpowered kind of the, the backward cost, and we got this weird non optimal behavior, right? So an actual bad goal cost was less than our estimated good goal cost, right? And that didn't work. So what that means is that we need our estimates to be less than the actual cost, less than or equal to, more specifically. Okay, so. This brings up the notion of admissible heuristics. So this is a definition. The idea is that an inadmissible heuristic is pessimistic in that it can overestimate the cost to get to the goal from that particular state. An admissible heuristic, which is optimistic, means that it is an underestimate or is equal to the actual cost to get to the goal. Right? And kind of the intuition here is that a pessimistic heuristic is going to trap good plans on the fringe, right? Because we have this bad pessimistic heuristic value being added to them. Whereas an admissible heuristic uh, will slow down bad plans, but it won't outweigh the true cost, right? Okay. More formally, a heuristic.
heuristic h is admissible if it is greater than or equal to zero. That's an important part. You can't have negative heuristic values and admissible heuristic. And it also must be less than or equal to h star of n here, where h star of n is the true cost to the nearest point. Right? So that's the optimal path from n to the nearest point. So some examples. Manhattan distance in Pac-Man is admissible. Why? Yes. You can't get there. If you remove the joint, is there an act along that path? Definitely not, right? Because that is the minimal number of actions it would take in an unconstrained world to get to the goal. Right? Because it can only go left, up, down, and right. Uh, this heuristic I defined for the pancakes, that's also here, uh, admissible. What about Euclidean distance in Pac Man's world? Is that admissible? Who said no? Anybody say no? You said no. Why is it not? Okay, but what is the definition of admissible? It is less than the actual cost. Is it always greater than or equal to zero? I mean, Euclidean, yeah, sure. Okay. So I think it is admissible, right? But it's going to be maybe less accurate, right? We've kind of talked about this. It's less true to how Pac-Man actually works in the world. Um, coming up with an admissible heuristic for your problem is most of what's involved in using A star in Pac-Man. So A star is A star is A star. Uh, it's pretty abstract. It's coming up with a good heuristic for your problem that is different than using A star. Okay. Let's talk about the optimality of A star when we have an admissible heuristic. Let's prove it, in fact. So here we have this kind of conceptualization of the search tree that we looked at last time. We're going to make some assumptions. Let's say that there is a goal node A that is optimal. Okay? And we have another goal node B that is suboptimal. Okay? And let's say that H is admissible. Now, I claim that if A exits the fringe before B, that's sufficient to say it's optimal. Okay, so let's prove it. Well, let's prove that A will exit the fringe before B. If you want to think about why that is optimal, think about it um, later on your own. Uh, it's a good exercise. Okay, so what's the proof? So let's imagine that B is on the fringe. It has to be on the fringe before it gets expanded, right? So at some point, if B is going to be the goal that we find first, it exists on the fringe, right? Okay. Some ancestor n of a must also be on the fringe. It might be a itself. Why is this true? Yes. So you start with an ancestor of a, and then like you know that you are expanding outward from that, so you won't you won't have anything but ancestors. Like the ancestor of a will always be on the fringe until you actually add a. Until it gets expanded, it or an ancestor of it is on the fringe, right? Yep. Um, great. Let's call that n. Okay? Just some general ancestor of a. So my claim here is that n will be expanded over the course of a star before b hits. So why is this the case? Well, first let's say, or note rather, that f of n is less than or equal to f of a. So why is this true? Okay, so f of n, by the definition of f of n, is g of n plus h of n, right? And we know that f of n is less than or equal to g of a by the admissibility of a, right? Does everybody see that? Okay. And we know that g of a is exactly equal to f of a because the heuristic at the goal must be 2, right? Okay, so that tells us then that f of n is less than or equal to f of a. Now I want to say that f of a is less than or equal to, or is less than strictly f of b. So why is that? Well, we know that g of a is less than g of b, strictly less than g of b. Why is that? Because we said so. B is suboptimal, right? If b was, if g of b was exactly equal to g of a, b would be an optimal goal as well, right? This is just the definition of optimal, and when we said by construction that g of b was suboptimal. Okay. 
And we showed just a minute ago that f of a was less than f of b, right? Well, no. We showed that f of n is less than or equal to f of a. Um, and f of a is less than or equal to f, is less than strictly than f of b. That's because the heuristic is zero at the goal, right? So this follows directly from g of a is less than g of b because h of a and h of b are both zero, right? That means that n is going to expand before b does. Right? Because f of n is less than or equal to f of a by our first point here, and strictly less than f of b. And this f value is what gets expanded. So if n is on the, in the priority queue, and b is in the priority queue, and f of n is strictly less than f of b, n will get expanded before b does. Right? OK? But I didn't make any claims about n other than it was an ancestor of a, right? So I can make this argument for every ancestor of a, uh, at which point we will expand the direct parent of a, put a on the tree, and then a, because its f value is less than uh, b's f value, will get expanded before b does, right? All ancestors of a get expanded before b, a gets expanded before b, a star of with an invisible case. Okay. So let's take five minutes here.
Yes. Good? Yes. Good? Generally speaking? Okay. That's good. I won't ask other questions. Okay. Let's talk about the properties of A star. So, kind of from a cartoon intuition sense, uniform costs kind of expanding in all directions in cost space without any notion of what the goal is. Uh, but A star has this notion, this guess of where the goal might be, and it kind of hones in on that. Right, kind of guides the direction um, that you're taking in the search. So pictorially, that might look something like this, whereas um, the uniform cost is expanding in this sphere. Right, but A star expands toward the goal, but kind of hedges its bets depending on the specific cost by moving in various directions. Right. Okay. So let's take a moment and guess some algorithms. I like guessing algorithms by looking at how they behave. So what algorithm is this? That's right. Okay. How about this one? That's right. Okay. I feel like you've seen that one before. Okay. How about this? You all are very into it. Okay. Perfect. Let's look at A star on this Pac Man small maze demo that we've got here. So that's the execution. Right? And this is using Manhattan distance as the heuristic. Right? It doesn't really mean anything to watch how A-star behaves if you don't define the heuristic. Okay. And so what you'll note is that it kind of got closer in a bad way. Right? It's not necessarily optimal in execution. It's optimal in finding the optimal path. Right? Yes? Um, so when we were doing Manhattan, we went this way and over. Well, we were doing it so different over. But uh, would it have been different if we went down and over? Like, would it have found it almost immediately? <coughs> So, does Manhattan distance have a notion of direction? Okay, it doesn't. It doesn't. Gotcha, it's just that. It's just the distance. Okay. Yep. Okay, so that's what it looked like when A star expanded. Um, there. And it did find the optimal search. So, if we compare kind of the three that we've looked at, right? Greedy may have gotten us to a solution faster than A star did. In this case, in fact, it did, but it wasn't the optimal solution. Um, and can't really make any guarantees. Greedy might have been really, really, really bad for this problem. We couldn't really say anything, right? Uh, uniform cost found an optimal solution, but it did it in a very bad, took a long time to compute kind of way. It expanded almost every node um, that there was, right? Whereas A star kind of did the best of both worlds. It was the optimal path. It didn't take very long. Okay, A star has applications all over the place. You will see ASAR pop up tons and tons and tons of places in computer science. This is a very, very influential and important algorithm. So these are some examples. Um, let's look at some more algorithm <coughs> guessing, because as I mentioned, I really like that. And let's look at this problem that we looked at last week, which is this maze. And maybe it's water where you have dark water that's deeper and it's maybe more dangerous, or some for some reason it costs more. Right? Okay, so what algorithm is this? Let's watch it again. Pay close attention to how it's expanding in the dark regions compared to the light regions. Yeah, also look at the cost, or look at the path that it came up with at the end. Yes, this is breadth for search. It had no notion of the cost of the deeper parts of the water than the more shallow parts of the water. Okay, how about this? Depth for search, right. Three. So is it finding the optimal path here? It's not. Yeah, so this was using, ooh, I think it's Manhattan distance again. Mm -hmm. um, it might be written off the check. Either way, not optimal. How about this one? And as we saw last time, it's still exploring in every direction, but in cost, in these cost spheres, right, along this cost contour rather than um, just distance, right? Or not, rather than just number of steps, right? Which is what UCS was doing. Or the what the uh yeah breath was using. Okay. How about this one? That's A star, finally. Okay. Most of the 
the work in solving real life search problems uh, comes in coming up with optimal or with admissible heuristics. That's really where a lot of the work is. Um, one key intuition when you're trying to define, uh, yes? Does how fast it finds optimal solutions depend on how close to correct the heuristic is? So the closer it is to being exactly equal, the shorter amount of time will take to search, or is that not strictly true? So it is true in a sense in that if it exactly equals the cost to the goal, okay, I'm gonna double check this, but I believe if it exactly equals the cost to the goal, it will do the fewest number of expansions required to find the optimal solution. I believe that's the case. I will check and get back to you before next class and make sure that's the case. The caveat here though, is that if you look at computation time, it's more of the story of the number of nodes expanding. Because, it may take time to determine what your heuristic value is at a given state, right? So if it is really, really cheap to compute the exact heuristic, you'll probably want to do that. But if it is really, really, really expensive, computationally speaking, to compute the exact heuristic, you may want to make it, right? Because it may actually be better to spend your time in computation expanding on uh, more nodes than in computing the heuristic required to expand fewer nodes. Follow-up question? No, uh, is there a way you could like do a meta search of lots of different heuristics to find the best heuristic and then do that? Sure. Yeah, you can do that. Um, the problem is how you really want some notion of how generalizable the quality of your heuristic is, right? Because if you only care about a specific instance of your search problem, and then you do that search, that parameter search, that meta search, then once you solve it, you don't need to keep looking at Right? You solve the whole problem that you're looking at here, the motivated problem that you're looking at. So you need it to be kind of abstractable over many instances. There's some art to that. Right? Okay, yes? So were you kind of suggesting with non-exact heuristics that maybe you do a probabilistic heuristic? But then, I guess, if you were to take the that, and that might be a good idea, but um, if you are trying to prove a probabilistic heuristic is admissible, that sounds like it would be really hard. Might be more difficult. And there is uh, a ton of work in coming up with various heuristics, in coming up with when to choose amongst a set of heuristics, in coming up with when to use inadmissible heuristics, but they're gonna work really well anyway, things like that. So there's a ton, a ton of work um, in this space. A lot of really, really interesting work. So uh, it sounds like you were using some kind of some stochastic heuristic or that was, uh, probabilistic in some way, it would be more difficult to prove that that was admissible. Maybe you don't need to, for reasons I'll get to in a minute. Um, well, you probably still will, for the reasons I'm gonna get to in a minute, but maybe you don't, for reasons I won't get to in a minute, which is that you can frequently use an admissible heuristic in combinations with heuristics that are admissible in some algorithms. Um, I may talk about that later, maybe next week. But yes, very good answer. Any other questions? Okay. So, Often, admissible heuristics are solutions to relaxed problems where new actions are available. So in the Euclidean distance heuristic, we've added a new action, which is basically fully connecting this graph, right? So this graph, graph is fully connected, then you can get from any node to any other node and just take the one that has the shortest distance, right? You're done. But the real, world doesn't have that action, right? But it does have all of the actions we described in the real world, like you can get to every city from every other city as described by the true graph that we show here, and then we've added a set of actions um, to that problem to create a heuristic, right? Similar with this, this is the, the Manhattan distance heuristic in Pac-Man is a relaxed problem. We've allowed Pac-Man to move through walls, right? Pac-Man also has the option to not move through walls in this relaxed version of the problem, right? So any optimal solution in the relaxed version um, has to be at least as good as the optimal solution in the unrelaxed version, right? So very frequently, if you can relax your problem, keep your action set, and the relaxed problem is a superset of the action set that you had in the true problem, you basically get admissibility for free. Make sense? 
As I mentioned just a second ago, inadmissible heuristics are frequently very useful as well, and there's been a lot of work in how do you choose when to use inadmissible versus admissible heuristics and combinations thereof. Okay. Let's talk about this heat puzzle that, that you brought up a little bit ago. So, is everybody familiar with how this works? Did you get these as children in like cereal boxes or things like this? Yeah. I will explain it. Okay, so you have a set of tiles, eight tiles on a board that can hold nine tiles. And these tiles can slide into the empty square if they're adjacent to the empty square, up, down, left, to right, you can't go diagonal. So we can slide the three up to the center here, we can slide the five over, we can slide the two down, we can slide the six over. That gets us to a new state. And then we can slide tiles based on where the empty space is there, right, and go on and on. And the goal then is to order the tiles like you see on the far right in the goal statement. Does that make sense? How many, well, what are the states? What would be a good abstraction for the states? Just some instance of the board, right? And some setting, right? How many states are there? A lot. Yeah, a bunch. I'll leave you to, to compute the actual amount. What are the actions? What's the set of actions? Sliding a tile, right? But there's depends on the state you're in, kind of which ones are good actions or achievable actions, which ones aren't. What's the successor from the start state? I kind of talked about this, but how many successors from this specific start state are there? Four. Four. That's right. What should the cost be? One, maybe for tile slip, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. So, what would a good heuristic for this first problem be? Yes. Distance of a tile from its final place. Distance of a tile from its final place. Which tile? Uh, all tiles. So, do you take the max or the sum, or what would be the one for like each? <coughs> Sure, but we need a heuristic value per state of the world, right? Yeah. And so what's the heuristic value for a specific state of the world? You have to consider all the tiles, maybe? Or maybe yeah. the max, yeah. that's what I'm asking. Yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe of those, maybe adding them all together. Adding them all together, what's your distance? What kind of distance? Um, well, it would be sort of just a measure of the disorder of the board. So that's what you're trying to get as a measure of the disorder of the board. What about Manhattan distance as our distance function here? Sure. Sure. Uh, I will get to that exact heuristic um, that you're describing after I talk about a worse heuristic that I was hoping somebody would say first. So, who has a worse heuristic than that but seems reasonable? Yes? How many are in the right place? Um, how many are in the right place? What's your heuristic value at the goal if you're measuring how many are in the right place? Yes, okay, that's exactly what I was hoping you would say. How many are in the wrong place? Or the number of tiles misplaced? Is this admissible? If you were paying attention, you might know. Who says yes? Who says no? Why would it not be? It seems like you wouldn't get a lot of information out of these possible moves, because there are a lot of in-between motions where the number of things in the incorrect space would have actually so that's a good discussion on how close to the true value it is, but not a discussion on how whether it's admissible or not. It is admissible um, because you must at least move every tile that's misplaced once, right? If you didn't have to move it, it would have been in the right place. So definitely it's lower for the reasons you were describing than the true cost, which might require moving many tiles in order to move one to the other place, right? So what's our heuristic of this specific start state under this notion of a heuristic? Mm -hmm. It's eight, they're all misplaced, yeah. right? Well, two, three, 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 three. Uh, Depends on where you want to define the empty space to be in your goal, right? But the way we've 
define the goal if it's all eight. Okay. So if we do uniform cost search on this problem where we are four steps, the true cost of the goal is four steps from where we are now, uniform cost search will expand on average 112. Yeah. If we are eight steps, 6,300. If we are 12 steps away from the true solution, which is really not that many steps, right, uniform cost search will expand on average 3.6 million mistakes. <laughs> We don't get you out from the solution. Um, this heuristic specifically we'll call tiles. <coughs> it will, on average, expand 13 states if you're four steps away, 39 if you're eight steps away, and 227 if you're 12 steps away. So heuristics maybe matter a lot, right? Okay. This is a relaxed problem heuristic, right? Because our actions are a superset of our possible actions in the real instance. Right? Does everybody see why that's the case? In the true world, I can only move a tile into the empty space from an adjacent space. Uh, in this relaxed world, I can move it wherever I want, including into the empty space. Right? The supersets of actions. Okay. <coughs> it is a fun drug. Okay. Let's talk about a different heuristic, which may have been brought up a minute ago in an awesome way. What if we had this puzzle where any tile could slide in any direction at any time and ignore the other tiles in the way? That heuristic is the sum of the Manhattan distances of the tiles in their current state from the goal. Right? That's the total Manhattan distance. Why is that admissible? Yes? Because each tile has to move at least that far to reach the final stair. Yeah, it does. And in many cases, we'll have to move further, probably. Another answer would have been because it's a relaxed <laughs> instance of the problem. Um, but that's a more precise answer for sure. OK. Um, we don't have to look at what the actual heuristic is in this start state. It's 18. OK. So let's call this heuristic the Manhattan heuristic. Uh, compared with the tiles heuristic, which is already, already orders of magnitude better um, for non-trivial tabs. Uh, it represents an even better improvement. What about using the actual cost as a heuristic? We kind of touched on this in our discuss discussion a minute ago. Would it be admissible? Yeah. Can anybody tell me why? Yes. We're always going to be greater than zero steps. Um, it's going to be less than, the optimal search is going to be exactly equal to the optimal goal, so you could say it's within yeah, it's less, I mean, it, the true cost is less than or equal to the true cost. Yeah. Um, you could say it's relaxed, but you know, under the same definition, because it's less than or equal to the actual goal. Yeah, so it is admissible. What's wrong with it? I've touched on this a little bit, but maybe we can talk about it more. Yes? The calculation itself is kind of a search problem, isn't it? It might be. It depends. I think. Okay. That, I mean, there are, there are problems. I'd have to think about it to come up with an example specifically, but there are problems where. You can say, I know the cost of the optimal path, but I can't tell you what it is. Yeah, okay. Maybe. If that was really fast to compute, this would be a really good heuristic for whatever that problem is. Yeah. Maybe I'll look for it and try to come up with one, but it, it's possible. Yes? So in this world, solving the actual cost is solving the problem, right? So wouldn't this heuristic be like as complicated as the search? Well, that's, that's kind of what I'm saying, is that I imagine but I need to look for it. There are problems where you can know the cost of the true solution, but not describe the true solution exactly. You can say, I know that an optimal solution will be of value 16, but I can't tell you what it was, right? Maybe. I mean, I'm pretty sure there are problems like that all over. But you're really close, right? If it requires solving the search in order to know what the heuristic is, then you don't need the heuristic, right? You've, you've done all the problem, all the work you would ever need to do in order to get the heuristic value this way. And there's this continuum here, maybe, how expensive it is, this is what we were touching on earlier, in order to compute your heuristic versus how close the true cost it is. Choosing the right value there, well, if, you're, if you have a bunch of heuristics to choose from, that's great. Um, you can use multiple ones on it. But it's, there's an arc to it, right? 
But the point is that what they start is a trade off between the quality of the estimate and the work it takes per node to compute the truth. Right? Okay. As your six get closer to the true cost, you'll expand fewer nodes, but usually do more work per node to compute the truth. So, um, if you can do that without doing more work, you should do that. Okay. One thing I want to talk about is the notion of using multiple heuristics. And one of the things to note here is that there's this notion of dominance. So this is a definition. If we have heuristic A, and heuristic A applied to every node N is greater than or equal to a different heuristic C for all N, then heuristic A is said to dominate heuristic C. And set of all heuristics actually forms a semi-lattice. Um, and what that means is that if you take the max of two admissible heuristics, the max of those is admissible. So what's the implication here? If you have two heuristics, and they're both cheap, and they produce different results sometimes, and they're both admissible, use them both, right? Using them both will be, from a heuristics perspective, no worse than using one or the other, but certainly usually better, probably, right? Yes? Can you use something else besides max, like adding or averaging, or, um, or would that be something we'd have to experiment with? We'd have to think about that. Um, certainly, it's trivial to show that the max is still admissible. Okay. There's also the trivial heuristic, right? Zero. What algorithm would you get if you did A star with a zero heuristic? That's right. That's just uniform cost. Okay. Um, we have five minutes left, but I want to spend more than five minutes on what's left in this lecture. So, why don't we stop there and we'll pick up the very end of this on Tuesday and then on Thank you.